safe now. <laughs> The readings today ask us to consider how we deal with sin. There are two ways that we're involved with sin. We commit sins ourselves, and we are also affected by the sins of other people. In the history of humanity, all religions had some concept of sin. All religions understood that there is some problem with human life that has to be resolved. And all religions try to deal with sin by restraining it. And the way of restraining <coughs> sin in all religions is religious law, making laws that say, well, look, don't do this or don't do that because bad results will occur. God's will become angry. Christianity presents a complete alternative to this whole history of religions. Christianity says that laws will never solve the problem of sin. We know that just by common sense in society, we've got pages and pages and pages of laws, but do we still have it's filled with people who are breaking the law. They tell the laws don't really solve the problem of human life. So Jesus says that all the commandments can be reduced to only two. Love God and love your name. He just said, I'll give you an alternative to all these pages and pages of laws. How about only two commandments? Love God and love your neighbor. In the reading from Romans, Paul gives his version of this teaching. He says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And whatever other commandments there may be, whatever other commandments there may be, are summed up in this, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to the neighbor. Hence, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love changes us so that we move beyond simply trying not to sin, trying to avoid sin. When we know we're loved by God, then all the things that cause us to sin, our insecurities, selfishness, our fears, all these things are healed, and we are free to treat other people with love, and if we really grow in this life, this love will flow out of us spontaneously. We won't even need anybody to tell us to do it. Does that mean that the, the Ten Commandments are no longer valid? Does that mean that the Ten Commandments are no longer valid? No, but it does mean that the Ten Commandments are limited. The Ten Commandments belong to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. We live in the New Covenant. The Ten Commandments give you the minimum conditions that make love possible. <coughs> but is it possible to obey the Ten Commandments and not love? Yes. This is the point of Jesus' encounter with the rich young man. Remember that in the Gospels. He comes and says, Lord, I've obeyed all the Ten Commandments, but what do I still lack? And Jesus says, well, you haven't loved anybody, so why don't you take some of your money and use it to love people? The Ten Commandments are a preparation for something else, for a life of love. And the love of God that we come to know in Christ is something beyond the Old Testament commandments, and it really allows us to move beyond them and to grow into this life of love in a completely new way. Love, as the final solution to sin, takes two particular forms in Christianity, and Jesus talks about these two forms in the Gospel teaching from Matthew. First, love takes the form of mercy and forgiveness. The reading from Matthew might be actually the first form of the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And you notice how that sacrament originally 
was a communal right where people uh, eventually had to tell their sin to the community and to the church. But it starts out, if your brother sins against you, you go and tell him his fault. You go. So love expressed as mercy means that we never leave people bound in their sin. The most cruel thing that I could do to someone is to know that they are sinning, to know that they are doing something that is not good for them, and just let them keep on doing it. So Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, if your brother does something that hurts you, then you go and uh, help him to see what he's doing. Mercy has the power to loose people, says Jesus, to free them from their sins. Love has the courage to confront the one that we care about because we know that it is the best for them. Love has the courage to tell people we care about about things they need to change, and not in a critical way, but in a spirit of mercy that assures them of our care for them, and assures them of our forgiveness. Jesus is concerned about the health of the family and the health of the community, because sin affects everybody. If a father is alcoholic, it just doesn't affect him, it affects the whole family. If a woman is jealous of her husband, it doesn't affect just her, it's going to affect her relationships with the whole family. So the goal of love is always to save the other person. The goal is not vengeance. The goal is not justice for oneself, a feeling of victory over the other person. The goal is salvation. Seeking the well-being of our sisters and brothers is the way to overcome sin. This is love. The second form that love takes, says Jesus, is prayer. Coming together in unity and prayer for one another. I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my Heavenly Father. Jesus says that love expresses itself especially as we are united together in prayer. Because to really pray for someone else, you have to know that person and you have to listen to their concerns. In the joy of the gospel, Pope Francis asks us to put more emphasis on intercessory prayer in gathering together in prayer for one another. And this is what he says, we must reject the temptation to live a prioritized and individualistic spirituality which does not accord with the demands of love. There is always a risk that prayer can become an excuse for a private lifestyle and can lead Christians to take refuge in false forms of spirituality. Sometimes we are tempted to be that kind of Christian who keeps the Lord's wounds at arm's length. Yet Jesus wants us to touch human misery, to touch the suffering flesh of others. And one form of prayer that particularly moves us to take up this task and to seek the good of others is the prayer of intercession. So the Pope is challenging us to pray not just for one another, but with one another. So the next time somebody asks you to pray for them, why don't you say, okay, why don't we sit down right now and I will pray with you. So the Pope says, let's come together in love for one another, in prayer. Let's not just say, well, you know, uh, okay, I'll pray for you and call me when things get better. You know? <laughs> but let's, uh, let's accompany one another in love, in prayer. So the final solution to sin is not law. It's not commandments. All the laws in the world will not stop us from sinning. The final solution to the problem of sin is love. First, the love of Jesus for us which gives us a sense of self-confidence, an assurance of God's confidence in us, and then our love for one another, which gives others the assurance of forgiveness and the confidence in the support of our prayers. So let us owe nothing to anyone except to love one another.